Luke 4, 14 through 30. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, and gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all, pe- all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all the synagogue was filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Let's pray together. Now, our Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to be able to come to this text again. Thank you for what it teaches us. Help us, Lord, to understand and to listen with a view to obedience. Father, give us grace as we approach your word. Give us humility, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I apologize. I don't think my mic was on at that time. I got hearing aids in, and I was hearing really well. (laughs) This is the first time I've worn them this morning uh, to church, and so it's a new experience for me. Well, I want you to mark your place here in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, and I want you to go with me to 1 Kings chapter 17, because we need to read these texts in order to understand the text that we're looking at. Remember, we're working our way through the Gospel of Luke. We have reached chapter 4, and we're going to continue as the Lord allows to work our way through the Gospel of Luke. But we're going this morning to 1 Kings chapter 17. This is a familiar story probably to most of you if you're students of your Bible. But I just wanted us to see it black and white together before we go back and read again the text and work our way through it from Luke 4. So Luke, uh, or rather 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now if you'll skip to verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and for my son, 
that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she came and rather, and she and he and her household (laughs) ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Now, if you would take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 14. And again, these are familiar words if you are students of your Bible. But they will help us again to understand what Jesus is doing in that first century synagogue in Nazareth when he was preaching in his hometown. 2 Kings 5 beginning in verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord would were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in, Naaman went in and told his Lord. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you, name in my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Parfar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came to him and said, My father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. All right, back to our text in Luke chapter four. We'll come back to those stories in just a few moments, but I just want to remind you that Jesus has come back from his baptism. He's come back in the power of the spirit. He's not come back weak and straggling and stumbling with his tail tucked between his legs. He's come back from that wilderness temptation in the power of the Spirit. He's cured many diseases. He's taught in the synagogues, not only around Galilee, but also down south in Judea and in Jerusalem. And uh, we have uh, seen, for example, uh, not recorded for us in Luke, that he's had, that is, that Jesus has had the conversation with the Pharisee Nicodemus, He's talked to the woman at Sychar. He has turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana. He has uh, killed, uh, rather healed a nobleman's son in Capernaum. So Jesus has been actually doing ministry for a year. But he shows up 
at Nazareth, verse 16 says, his hometown. And you can imagine the excitement, the anticipation of the people that this hometown preacher boy finally has come back to their home. He's going to preach in their synagogue. They had been hearing all that he was doing. They had been trying to understand who he was. They knew that he was of their own town and the son of Joseph and Mary in their own mind and their own understanding. So now he's come back and he's going to preach in their synagogue. And we talked about the fact that Luke has recorded for us that Jesus is sitting down to read from the scroll of Isaiah. They would have sang some songs and they would have a scripture reading from the Psalms and they would have had a scripture reading from the prophets. That's where Luke picks up the story. They're in the synagogue at Nazareth. The audience, the men, are there listening intently to what Jesus had to say. They're excited that he's come back. Jesus intentionally picks a text out of Isaiah chapter 61, and he reads those verses beginning there in verses 18 and verse 19. And remember what Jesus is emphasizing is the spiritual work that he's going to do. He's going to proclaim good news to the poor in spirit. He's going to proclaim liberty to the captives of sin. He's going to preach good news and recovering of sight to the spiritually blind. He's going to set at liberty those who are oppressed by Satan. And he wrote up the scroll as he read that text. And he gave it back to the attendant. And now he sat down to preach. And notice that the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. They're, they're listening. They're anticipating. They're leaning forward. What are you going to say to us, Jesus? We want to hear what you had to say. And so Luke records for us one sentence of the sermon. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And he continued from there. I don't know exactly what he said. It would be speculation. But no doubt he's talking about the text. He's talking about himself being the one that the prophet Isaiah wrote about six to seven hundred years before. The very words of Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 and 2 that Jesus read that day in the synagogue at Nazareth referred to him. He's saying, this is me. I'm the one these verses are talking about. I'm the one who's going to proclaim that good news and liberty and recovery of sight to the blind and liberty to the oppressed. This is the year of the Lord's favor. It's here. I'm here. I'm the Son of God. I've come. And they listened. Notice verse 22. And all spoke well of Him. And they marveled at the gracious words that He's saying. But as they as Jesus continued to preach and continued to make the emphasis, make the point, I'm the one, this Messiah that you're expecting and you have been looking to, to come, I'm Him. I'm here. I'm the Messiah that you read about in the Psalms. I'm the Messiah that you read about in the prophets. I'm the one that's been foretold. I'm here. I'm the one. And they listened to that. And I think they begin to change in their thinking. Now remember, they think that they're good with God. They have right standing with God. They're Jews. They're the people of the covenants. They're the people of the promises. God has worked in their midst. They're special. They're privileged. And as they listen, they think, wait a minute, Jesus. You grew up right here. We watched you grow up in this town. Is this not Joseph's son? And you're telling us that you're the Messiah. You're telling us that Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 talk about you? Jesus, we know your mother. We know your sisters. We know your brothers. How can you tell us that you're the Messiah? How can you? We we can't understand that. And we don't put these two things together. Notice what Jesus says there, beginning in verse 23. This this proves to you, by the way, that he is God. He knows that this is what they're thinking. They haven't said this, 
But he knows they're thinking this. Doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Jesus is saying, this is what you're thinking. All you in the synagogue right now, you're hearing these words, and now you're changing your thought about me. You began to understand or think about who I was, and though you spoke well in the beginning, now you've turned. And here's what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, show us a sign. If you're really that one that Isaiah talks about, we need evidence. We need proof. We need something that gives us solid belief that you are that one. We want a sign, Jesus. We have heard, we have heard about your signs that you did in Capernaum when he healed the nobleman's son. We've heard about that. There's a little bit of unbelief in that, is there not? Uh, Jesus, we don't know if it's true or not. You say who you are, but we want a sign. If that's who you are, we want a sign. I mean, this is the condemnation of Jews. This is what has been the historical reality of the Gospels. The Jews did not believe. They didn't believe. That's what's going on here. And Jesus is making the point, you don't believe. You think that you can come to God just as you are. Just as you are. And all of your nationality, all of your spiritual morality, all of the promises and the covenants, all of the prophetic words, you think that you're okay with God and that you can come to God, but you cannot come to God because you do not believe in me. You don't believe. And here's the proof that you don't believe. He he tells the stories. He said, there's no prophet which is going to be acceptable in in his hometown. But here's what I want you to understand. Back in the days of the prophet Elijah, when there was a famine in the land, there were many Jews, no doubt, who lived in the land. And Elijah was sent to a Gentile widow in the land of Zarephath. And the reason is because the Jews wouldn't believe. They had rejected the word of the Lord. And now the prophet of the Lord is sent to a foreign land. Remember what happened as we read that story? Elijah said, make me a little bread, bring me a little water. She said, I'm just making what I can for my son and I. We're going to eat it and we're going to die. And he said, do that, but bring it to me first. I mean, it takes some belief to do that, does it not? If you're about to eat your last meal, you're probably not going to share that with somebody, right? If you know that this is the last morsel of bread that you're going to eat and you're going to die, I'm not really sure that I want to share that with you, but she did. Remember the promise that was made. The flour and the oil would not be spent. It would not be empty. So she believed. That's the point that is being made. That's why Jesus says, in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. That is Jewish widows. And when the heavens were shut up three days and six months, and there was a great famine over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none other but to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. I mean, this cut these people who are listening to this to the quick. First of all, she's a Gentile. Secondly, she's a believing Gentile. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, you Jews are going to be overlooked for the Gentiles. Boy, they, they could not even believe what they were hearing. I mean, the the rage, the blood pressure is going up. The rage is going up. The temperature in the room is getting hotter. Jesus says, I'll just give you another example. And he talks about Naaman, the leper. A great general, won many victories, but the problem was he had leprosy. 
So he's sent by his king to Israel. And Elisha then is the prophet, the one who took Elijah's place. Elijah, Elisha. Elisha now is going to tell Naaman what to do. It took belief. At first, he didn't want to, right? He's like, are you kidding me? The rivers of Damascus are better than the Jordan River. I can do that there. He didn't even come out and make a show of it. He didn't make a big deal out of it. He just told me. He didn't even show up. He just told me to go jump in the river seven times. And his servant said, hey, listen. If he'd have told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you do it? And he said, yes. And, he, and they said, well, go dip in the, jump in the river seven times. Go dip seven times. What's the big deal? And he believed. And he went and did it. We read that the, less, le, the leprosy was cured, right? I mean, Jesus makes these two stories as part of what he is saying about the Jews not believing And I just want to tell you something. You know that there are many people in our culture today that are a lot like these Jews? You know them. You've talked to them. Uh, Perhaps they're in your family. They're your co-workers. They're your your friends. And they say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But the question is, do you believe in Jesus of the Bible? Not do you believe in Jesus. Popular culture tells you what to believe in Jesus, that Jesus is loving, gracious, he was a good teacher, he would never in any way condemn anyone. Uh, he, he, he was always merciful. Uh, that Jesus, we're talking about the Jesus of the Bible who is courageous, who stands against sin, who condemns sin when it has to be condemned, who stands against self-righteousness. Do you believe in that Jesus who lived the perfect life that God requires everybody to live And then he paid the price for everybody's sin because nobody could live that perfect life. Do you believe in that Jesus? So they wanted to believe in the Messiah of their own making. Like people in our culture to do want to believe in the Jesus of their own making. They they, they don't believe the Jesus of the Bible. If they believed in the Jesus of the Bible, they would be humbled, they would be broken, They would try to live a life that is consistent with Scripture. But instead, they want to make Jesus something that fits their understanding. That's what's happening here. We want the Messiah that fits our understanding. Now, the Messiah that we know is going to come and liberate us from the Romans. He's going to set Israel in a good place where there will be economic prosperity, there will be safety, there will be security. You're saying... Joseph's son, you're saying that you're this Messiah? Well, we need some evidence. We want a sign that you are that one. Jesus says, I'll give you a sign, Elijah and Elisha. Those are your signs. Those are Gentiles who believe. They were pagans who believed. You have all the covenants. You have the promises. You have the history with relationship with God. You've seen the miracles. You had the ancestry, and you won't believe. You won't believe. Notice what their response is. When they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. I mean, this is more than they can take. Who are you, Jesus? We watched you. We understand who you are. You can't come in here and tell us that God is going to overlook us. You can't call us unbelieving. You can't compare us to those Gentiles. Who are you? And they rushed the podium. Jesus was sitting and they literally rushed the podium. They rose up and they drove him out of the town. They brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built. They kept pushing and shoving. They were all crowding around him. Jesus allowed himself, he allowed himself to be pushed to the brow of the hill. And they're angry. They're so angry, they don't want to take the time to pick up the stones to stone him to death. We're just going to knock you off this hill. We're going to make sure you die. Immediately. Because you cannot say that to us. 
We are believing Jews. Who are you? Notice verse 30. But passing through their midst, he went away. It all stopped. It all stopped. I mean, the anger, the wrath, right at the edge of the hill. I mean, who's in control here? Jesus, right? I mean, it's not his time. He's not going to die by being pushed off the brow of the hill in Nazareth. He's not going to die until he goes and suffers and dies on that cross that has been ordained for him to die on. He's not going to die. So he just stopped. Everything just stopped. It was a miracle. Had to be a miracle. He just walked through. Now, that happens, by the way, several times. John records it in John chapter 8, John chapter 10, uh, where uh, a couple of times the Jewish leaders picked up stones to throw them at him. And he just walked away. That's not how he's supposed to die, by being stoned to death, right? He has to be crucified. That's what God had said. That's the way it would go. He just escapes by walking through their midst. I I just wonder what they were thinking. I, I wonder what the thoughts were immediately there as they watched Jesus walk away from the brow of the hill. You know that one day Jesus would choose not to escape. One day he would pray to his father. Lord, if there's any, Father, if there's any way of escape, would you let me take it? But that night he would choose to be obedient to the Father's plan. And rather than escape the suffering and the death to come, he would willingly accept that in obedience and love to the Father on our behalf. And he wouldn't escape. He could. He could. He could have called 12 legions of angels, remember? He could have any moment. But he would not. He chose not because he was being obedient to the Father and he, out of love for the Father, went all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. He had no sin. He was perfectly righteous. You and I are the ones who had the sin. You and I are the ones who are in need of righteousness. You and I are the ones who deserve the wages of sin. We are the lawbreakers. He is the law keeper. But he wouldn't allow himself to use the way of escape. I mean, Jesus, look, I I, I say this. Jesus is in total control of everything that's happening in that synagogue in Nazareth. There's not one thing that's happened that he's out of control. There's not one thing at the end of his life when he suffers and dies. There's not one thing, not one moment of that, that Jesus' life has taken from him. What did he say? I give my life willingly. Nobody killed Jesus. He gave his life willingly to be killed because he is sovereign and in control. Sometimes we read this text, and sometimes people react even today just like these people. You know why? Because it says God is sovereign. These people will be saved. These people will not. That makes people mad even today. Uh, Nobody's ever rushed the platform and tried to drag me off the pulpit. But God is sovereign. And those that he has ordained from eternity, to be saved, will be saved. Amen. Others will be left alone. Amen. Does it make God unfair? Does it make God unjust? He doesn't have to save anybody. He is sovereign, and he has ordained a people to be saved so that Jesus might receive the reward of his suffering and death. And so it is urgent, it is important that you be saved. 
you'd be saved. Don't make any kind of excuse and say, well, I must not be a chosen. No. It, you'd be saved. You'd be saved. You come to salvation. You believe in Jesus. You repent of your sin. You turn from that. You believe in what Christ has accomplished for you. Be saved today. Be saved. Be saved. No excuses. You be saved. You turn from your sin. Be born from above. Come to Christ. You tell everybody the same thing. Everybody. You must be born from, a gun, uh, born from above. Please be saved. Here's how the gospel goes. Tell them. Tell them. No matter what you do, you tell them. That is our job. God is sovereign. Elect will be saved. But you and I must pursue them. They, they will go to hell, as one preacher said, over our dead bodies. Because we will pursue them to the last breath of our wants. So pursue them. Invite them to Christ. That they would be saved. But don't, look. Don't react like these people. Don't be unbelieving. Don't be unbelieving. Don't be angry. Repent, turn from your sin. Be thankful that God has made a way of salvation for us. Immediately uh, after I pray, uh, Duffy's going to lead us in a song, and then we're going to have some instructions about the chili supper, the chili lunch, rather, chili cook-off. Uh, some of you are not going to be able to stay. I understand that. We're going to dismiss in just a moment uh, for you to be able to depart if you'd like to do that. But you're all welcome to stay, certainly. We'd be glad for you too. Now, let me lead us in prayer. Duffy will sing, uh, uh, lead us in a song. Uh, Linda Brenda will come in prayerfully. Uh, she'll be back there and she'll come here and give us some instructions. So let me pray.